Tonight we're going to talk a little bit, uh, sort of a, uh, I guess more of a specialty. Sometimes I tend to go off in uh, other directions. But tonight we're going to talk about a, a recent uh, fetish of ours, and that's uh, <laughs> crevice gardening. Uh, and crevice gardening is, we say it's a new trend. It's actually not a new trend. It's an old trend because nature's been gardening with crevice gardens for years. I, I, Ever since I was a young kid, I was fascinated by nature. I would go out on my own in the afternoons after school, and then when we took those family vacations, you know, everybody's driving down the road to sleep, except my father was driving, and I'm looking out at rocks and, and, and things in the, in the wild. And I'm always fascinated with uplifts. Uplifts just just blew my mind. As a young kid, I could not wrap my brain around how rocks went up, how the earth actually came up and and made these crevices. That was absolutely fascinating. This is from a trip I took a couple of years ago out to uh, Arkansas. And I just, it, it's just mind-boggling to be there and think that, that nature has taken the earth and just stood it up on the edge. So here we are, just moving it a little closer. So this is a natural garden. Look at the plants growing right here in the crevices. And these are teeny tiny crevices. <coughs> Zooming in. This is the same crevice. So here we got, we got ferns, we got uh, flocks, uh, probably a little goldenrod, there's a dentaria, uh, and then tons of weeds. But <laughs> it's, it's amazing what things in the wild that we don't think of. We see rocks and we just drive by and think, well, that's rocks. But that's this entire incredible habitat that, that we don't realize. Even shrub. This is a, a wild blueberry in the wild in Arkansas. Look at that. That seed dropped just right in the crack. And as it grows, it's actually peeling that rock back just a little bit to be able to survive. Often plants that do this become very dwarf. The same trip. <coughs> a little pine. There's no telling how old that pine is because it is there's no soil there. It's it's or very little. It's just right there in that crevice. So this type of gardening has always fascinated me and it's so true with everything in our lives. It's a compilation of everything we've learned and all these experiences that bring us to where we are today. So often we're not conscious of things that happened. When I was a young kid and I'm seeing all these rock things, it may not have been conscious, but all that sort of piles up and is stored in your memory and you combine that with other things. <coughs> Crevice gardening is, is, is having a resurgence now. Uh, in human terms, uh, the Czechs are really credited with bringing that uh, from the natural world and sort of trying to mimic that in the world. And that's really spread around. This is actually a municipal tennis court in Colorado that I visited last year. The last place you'd expect to see crevice garden. But the neat thing about it is you plant it, there's no watering. Once you get it in, it, that's it. And Denver's not a not a, an area that uh, really gets a lot of rainfall. So if you tolerate there and their hot sun and their dry temperature, it's pretty amazing. There's every there's every iteration of crevice garden around there. This was actually done in the Denver Botanic Gardens. They got some artists and had them try the crevice garden. Now I don't know that you're actually going to be able to grow anything in the crevices. They did leave a little hole at the top, but this is actually cemented together, so I, I'm not really sure how plants are going to survive, but artistically, it's absolutely fascinating. And I said that, that memories and experiences really have a great effect on us. Back in the, oh, probably 80s now, I went to a lecture out at the Sheraton Imperial. Uh, the North American Rock Garden Society had brought in uh, Harlan Hand, the gardener from San Francisco Bay Area, that created this incredible garden. He was an artist, all with concrete, 100 percent. And I remember just all through his lecture, just trying to wrap my brain around, how do you make a garden with concrete? That just sounds so, it sounds like the antithesis of gardening. You're taking this 
artificial material, but I just kept looking at the pictures, and then years later, I went out and visited his garden, and visited now about three times uh, in the Bay Area, and it's just absolutely amazing. You, only, you don't realize it's concrete, and that's what his point was, is concrete, is my, the guy put in our driveway said, concrete is alive. <laughs> never thought of concrete as being alive. But I remember we had our driveway, our new house port, and you'd go out there in the morning and, and the dew would hit or, or we watered it, and you actually can listen to it. You can sit there, you can actually hear it. Our concrete driveway now, if it's a hot day and you put water on it, you can actually sit there and you can listen to it. It's fascinating. So it's, it is alive. It's, it's as alive as any stone we put in our garden. So, this really influenced me in bringing together, seeing all these crevice gardens. And then a situation that happened to us about uh, now probably four years ago, we were able to run some more neighbors off. <laughs> <laughs> Next door neighbors, those of you who've been out of the house recognize the house. And so we were like, okay, what do we do with this? We'd like to get rid of the houses and, and build us a, a house. So we, we course thing you do called Habitat for Humanity. Well, they came out and explained to us that for us to give them the house, we also had to give them $29,000 to take it. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready with a different definition of give. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the next best thing. We put an ad on Craigslist. One house, one barn. And sure enough, we get a call from these two guys from Oxford. And they came down and completely took apart the house and barn and hauled it all to Oxford, which was really amazing. Uh, and going to put it back up there. God knows if they've done it. But the only thing they didn't want was the concrete. So we had this big parking area, and we had the foundations coming up from the house. You can see some pieces there. And so we contacted our local waste disposal company and said, you know, we'd like a big concrete dumpster to put dumpster in, to put concrete in. Well, fine, well, it cost you $800 per load. That's another one of those. We're going to give you our concrete, and they wanted us to pay them. I said, I'm really having a problem with this give thing. So, so we, I called, uh, called our workers, uh, called uh, Jeremy, who's uh, here today. Jeremy's our ground supervisor. And I said, Jeremy, I want you to take all this concrete and put it on pallets. And he looked at me like I had snakes coming out of my ears. <laughs> I said, we're going to make us a crevice garden. He said, what's a crevice garden? So we went into the internet and started Googling crevice <coughs> gardens. And, and uh, it didn't take long. He actually got pretty excited about the crevice garden. So this is our first stop pile, probably about, I'm guessing, 150 tons, maybe. <laughs> concrete. It's a lot of concrete. We saved a lot of stuff from the landfill. Yeah. And so then we had to have an area for the crevice garden. So I said, you know, how about we take down this 300-foot hedge of Nellie Stevens holly? So here's Jeremy putting on his uh, chainsaw gear and taking out the hollies, and uh, this is what resulted. So we've got a beautiful pallet now to put a, uh, a crevice garden in. So the crevice garden began down on the, uh, the north end. This is the first section. And first thing we did, we do with all our beds, we mix our native soil with compost because we really want a, a, a nice rich ground. But we don't want the plants growing in this, in this case, because the whole purpose of a crevice garden is for plants that need exceptional drainage. Now, our soil drains well. We're on sand. We're on beach sand. But even that's not good enough. We got lots of plants we've killed many times because where many of these crevice garden plants grow, they get 8 to 12 inches of rain a year. Okay, we get 46. So four times as much rain is enough to kill a lot of these. So what we did then is we brought the pallets up and Jeremy began stacking all the pallets. He gets all the credit for the design and the uh, installation of all of this. So this is the uh, beginning. Now, first thing we have to do is, is how do you get the concrete in pieces that you want? Because we broke it up initially with the backhoe. Well, uh, the answer is, really a lot of hard work. <laughs> we talked about aching backs and aching muscles. So this was uh, Jeremy's tools of choice until we discovered concrete saws. Uh -huh. <laughs> and on the second section, boy, they make a big difference. So, uh, I'm sure he'd be glad to tell you about the joys of concrete saws. 
So this was our first section, and again, not a lot of experience in this. This is this is fairly new as we're beginning. The the Czechs don't like our style because our crevices are too big. They like crevices that are like a sixteenth of an inch. Well, I have a little problem getting plants down in those. So we made our crevices a little bit bigger because again, we are a very different climate. We did make some small crevices, absolutely. But this was sort of our first, and, and the first plants were put in pretty much 12 months ago, so almost uh, a year ago today. And this first section, we call this section one, was divided really into three parts. What you first saw was back on the very back there, second section, and third section. In between them, we do have some pockets of regular compost simply to break up the monotony of, of having so much rocks. <coughs> and this was a section we brought in a... Uh, a designer from New York, a, a fellow member of NARGS, Michael Piedman. Michael had very different styles because we had pretty much, you saw the style before, and so Michael began showing us how to use facing on the rock, which is something we haven't done. So, in other words, turn it one way, but then also edge it with another way. And then in this, this was a very interesting section. It, it seems random, but we actually look at it, he created the most amazing planting pockets in it. And he came to us with an idea. He said, would you take a section and plant it in lime? I said, what do you mean lime? I said, you know, lime out of a bag. I don't think you can grow anything in lime. He said, sure you can. <laughs> I, what the hell, you know, I mean, we're, that's what we do is experiment. So this entire section, the bottom half here, is all planted in lime. Dolomitic lime poured right out of the back. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to find out what the pH of lime is, but you can't find it out. It's nowhere on the internet anywhere. I looked at probably a thousand sites. So we got in lime and we sent it off to the soil lab to test it. The pH of lime is 7.0. And we're like, what? I mean, I was figuring somewhere between 8 and 10. 7.0. When lime gets wet, it's really mucky. But yet, we've got some plants. We've killed a lot in that section, but we've got a lot of plants <laughs> that actually do survive and actually thrive. Any plant that has the species or specific epithet Dolomiticus, we plant in there. <laughs> we know that's probably going to be a really good plant. Uh, and there it is as we've uh, finished sort of uh, uh, planting. This would have been probably last uh, June. And there it is from the back side. So up on the top is where the, uh, the lime section is. Now, instead of using sand, which is typically what the Czechs use, we began, we wanted to try and experiment with uh, uh, a North Carolina material called permatil. This is a, it's basically a slate, this pop to make lightweight cinder blocks or lightweight concrete blocks up in uh, Salisbury, North Carolina. It has a pH of between 8 and 8.2. So everything in here has to tolerate extremely alkaline conditions. So that's the question is, what can we grow in those uh, pHs? And there it is at the end of last season. It's, it, the growth is absolutely shocking. Uh, we've, we had root growth in six months that was down 12 to 18 inches in pure gravel. Well, almost pure gravel. Jeremy threw a little bit of, you know, less than 1% of other material in, and he can tell you about that later. But the, the root growth is absolutely amazing. And we watered the stuff in, and that's pretty much it all through the summer. So hot, dry. So it's, you talk about maintenance free, it's as close as you're going to get. And that's just a different shot. This is the lime section up here. So there are things actually thriving in that section. So then we move to section two. And this is one that Jeremy was very concerned because it's pretty steep now. So we went from almost flat to a seven foot high cliff. And I said, well, I want a seep. I've always wanted a, an alkaline seep so we can grow alkaline seep plants. Because who has an alkaline seep around here? So uh, this is uh, Jeremy's start on this and then we, we had the opportunity to bring in Kenton Seth from Colorado. Kenton's like the, he's like the, the Crevis Garden designer du jour. Uh, he's really an amazing artist uh, that worked with rocks. 
And so we said, we'd like you to come be a part of our project for a week. And he, he admitted he was a bit skeptical working with concrete. That's just not, you know, if you're a rock guy, you're into the natural world, the natural thing, and you just, concrete's a little different. <laughs> it was so neat. We did bring him in. This is Kenton uh, here with Jeremy trying to figure out what the heck they're going to do. And there was a lot of ciphering that went on uh, trying to get this seep in. There was a lot of head scratching trying to <laughs> figure out what was going on, uh, trying to get the seep in. But uh, we brought in enough help, and just with the two of them just bouncing ideas off each other, this became our uh, crevice seep. And so this is just part of the installation process. It's interesting, they used uh, pry bars and using a lot of uh, physics forces to roll uh, pieces in place. Every piece now is cut uh, in certain sections. Uh, Jeremy cuts in like three different uh, sections and this uses those three different forms uh, wherever they're needed. So here that's going in. And this is again part of the process. One of the neat things that uh, Ken showed us is how to bend concrete. Because we've been doing it sort of straight. He's like, no, 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 no. You, you can bend concrete. You can make these artistic swirls with flat concrete. You're like, really? <laughs> and it's absolutely amazing when you get that artist's brain and the ability to, to understand how to work with these materials. And so this became the second section. There's our seep in the middle. It's finished. But look at the swirls in it. You typically would not think of concrete as something that would be in any way artistic. But yet, here it is. So there's a little close-up of the seat, and then to create a walkway space in the front, because for us it's very important that people be able to see and touch and feel and smell the plants, we use the house foundation. So all the house I showed you, all those big foundation pieces became walkways. And then in between them, Jeremy had the idea of putting concrete pieces to break them up to help mimic the, uh, uh, the wall. It's, it's really an astonishing uh, feed if you haven't seen it in person. So here's our seat up close. And what we did is we've got water coming in right to the top and it drips in three places. It doesn't run, it just drips. Just like what you would see if you go in the wild where the water just drips. And it creates neat effects. It will create moss all over. And then we took soil and put probably an inch right at the back for plants that like growing here. Down below the seat, we have plants that like to grow in waterfalls. So here we go. This is right up next to the rock. This is our native Houstonia. Absolutely thrilled. Growing in less than one inch of material and just happy as a clam. And it's going to spread and just cover that entire spot. Down below it, we have epimediums. Because in the wild, where they grow is in rock cracks and waterfalls. Just never had a rock crack waterfall form to grow in. So now we do. And it just sailed through the winter, and that's it uh, yesterday uh, in the garden. It's really going to be neat when that fills in and starts, uh, starts wrapping around the concrete. Mm. So there's that section now. That's what you would see if you came out. And it's really, uh, really starting to pop uh, in the last uh, couple of days. And that's just from a, just a different view. You can see the walkway down and again. So people can get up, because I see so many crevices, gardens, that are so deep you can't actually get to the plants. And crevice garden plants, by their nature, are pretty darn small. <laughs> and we want you to be able to get up again and use your five senses to really enjoy and to, to learn about those. One of the things we also did that you typically don't see with crevice gardens. Crevice gardens are typically made by collectors with no sense of artistic design because that's not what they are. They're collectors. It's very rare that you see a garden that was actually designed using colors, textures, and forms. Mm -hmm. And that's what we tried to use throughout the garden. We tried to carry that in to the crevice gardens as well. So looking at what are the forms, what are the textures, how do we interplay those together? So it's a very different process when we're planting, other than just finding the spot that the plant's going to grow, is where it's going to grow and thrive, and what can we put around it to make it look more aesthetic. So talk a little bit about the plants. Uh, our pH in our crevices, as I mentioned, 8.2. So we know things like agaves are going to do pretty well because in the wild they generally grow in a pH from 8.5 to 9.5. Pretty darn alkaline. On the other hand, 
This is one of our native tephrosias, tephrosia spicata, native on our property. Our native pH on our property is 3.2. <laughs> so, let's think, what's that, 10,000 times as acid as 8.2? I mean, it's, it's like insane. That was 100,000 times. So this plant likes to grow 100,000 times as acidic as the other. So the question is, will that grow in the crevice garden? And the answer is yes. We planted in there, and it actually grew better, far better, than it did in our native soil. By the end of the season, we had a clump almost this big. In the wild, on our site, we never have it any bigger than this. So this plant actually grew far better in a completely different environment than it's native to growing. We get so caught up, and I've always heard that you have to duplicate what you find in the wild. No, you don't. No. The plant exists in the wild where it persists without human intervention and without competition. Not where it grows its best. So this was a really, really neat experiment for us. So I want to just go through some of the plants that we've uh, uh, found that do well. And I've loved these by families. And this is on your sheet because I found this very interesting to look at what family, because if you're starting this, it can be a little overwhelming where to start. So pick out a family you like. So here we are starting with AZOAC. I can't even pronounce that. It's got an A and a bunch of Z's. <laughs> and this is, a lot of these are from South Africa. These are very succulent plants. The Delospermas. This is Delosperma colides, uh, introduced from uh, uh, Denver Botanic Gardens. Normally, this plant looks great in spring, and it usually dies in the summer, or close to that. It just can't take the moisture. So by having it in the crevice, all of a sudden it's fine, because there is no soil in there. It is pretty much as straight a drainage as you can get. Down deep, you get 18 inches deep. Mm -hmm. Little chasmatophyllum, another little cycle that actually likes a little more shade. Mm -hmm. So what we're able to do by the crevices is we create shade simply by having a piece of concrete up a little higher. You put it on the uh, east side, you've got shade. You put it on the west side, you've got more sun. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to be thought about when you do these is orientation and how deep you make the crevices and how high your planting material is up on them because you might need that shade. Uh, all of the little uh, Loenopsis times the Nanthus. This is a hybrid of two genera of uh, South African succulents and this is it blooming at the garden this spring. Just the colors are just surreal. And I've read for years these things were hardy in Colorado. I mean, they, these, they, they're guys in Denver breeding these. I've never got one to come through a winter until crevices. That's the key. You have to keep them dry in the wintertime. Denver has a lot of snow, but it's dry snow. They don't get wet snow, not usually. So it's really neat to be able to succeed with some of these AZOEs. Lithops. Sail through this winter in the garden. How cool is that? We can all be growing lithops. I mean, these, these, we've had lithops in the garden actually for about three years now. But they have to be shielded. See how they're right at the edge? That's the key. Keep them dry in the wintertime. They're, they're absolutely fine here. I mean, it's, it's a slow plant. It's, it's, it's like it's slower than watching paint dry. <laughs> these things are just painful. But they're, if you're into the intricacies of nature, there's nothing like a lithops. I mean, that's that's the size of a nickel, and that's probably three years old. It just—it's not going to be a Walmart plant. It's just not. <laughs> it's not going to see these at the box stores. And then we move into the asparagus family, and the asparagus family includes now all of the agaves. So we learned something very interesting this winter because this winter, it wasn't extraordinarily cold but we had 200 straight hours we did not get above freezing that's that's 30 percent more than we've ever had in recorded history in raleigh we lost more agaves than we've ever lost in our entire lives it's it's, it's unbelievable the losses what we found is we actually we thought putting them in the crevice card would help us because they stay drier which it did but when we started taking soil temperatures in the crevices, because there's no soil to insulate, the temperatures were five to six degrees cooler, down 18 inches. Whoa. 
which we did not anticipate at all. We anticipate, I anticipated, you know, a couple inches, but not 18 inches. So we take now, every week, we're taking reading 6, 8, 6, 12, and 18 inches. Some agaves did fine, but we killed a lot of agaves in the crevice garden. So it, it, it is great for drainage, but not so good for, for roots that need some protection. This one actually fared very well. This is agave bracteosa. It's a Mexican species up around 8,000 feet elevation. So anything that was hardy came through fine. So we were actually able to take agaves like this. This is agave neo-mexicana sunspot. I've killed that everywhere I put it in the garden. It's not a hardiness problem because it's like a zone five plant. It just, it always dies in the winter no matter what I do. Came through in the crevice garden. It was fine. So it didn't bother, the cold didn't bother it because again, it's hardy to minus 20. For it, it's only drainage. So that one came through. So we learned that there's certain things the crevice garden is really great for and there's certain things it's not so great for. So thrilled to have that. And it's just one of our new oddities. This is actually a hybrid of virus between yucca and hesperala. So we call these yuccalos. Uh, there's only two of them in existence in the world. We have both of them. But we're, we've got uh, other people now. We've sicked on the breeding trail. And these are really cute little dwarfs, sort of. I mean, they're really mutated. It's, it's, it's like breeding a chimpanzee and a human, you know, it's going to be pretty darn weird. But I don't think it'll ever grow very big, but it's cute and interesting. Yeah. Then we move into the asphodel family, the asphodelos. Uh, this is one of the hardiest of the aloes. This is uh, aloe aristata. Again, it's, it's fine in the crevice as long as you plant it in sand. If you put it here, it's going to get too cold because it's one of those that's marginal. So we've had this for years in other crevices, but in this crevice with the permatill, it's too cold on the roots and uh, it didn't bake it, but the others in the other garden are, are fine. Okay, in the uh, Asteraceae family, uh, this is a, a very interesting family in, in how many members uh, are in rock gardens. Asteraceae we know of as chrysanthemums. Uh, this is an inula. This is a little dwarf inula. Now, the normal inulas most people grow are like seven foot tall. This one's seven inches tall. This is inula verbascifolia. Just an absolutely beautiful little felty velvet leaf. And normally, felty velvet leaves mean we're going to die during summer. But this one absolutely sailed through last summer. Is that incredible? I took this picture yesterday. That's Anacyclus pyrenaica from the Pyrenees Mountains. I think that is amazing. This was just put in as a seedling uh, last summer. And just, it's so elegant. You can look at it underneath, you can look at it on top. It just, it, it's a different plant everywhere you view it. I just, I'm absolutely in love with Anacyclus now. Another same family, this is Hypoxis. This is actually a federally endangered, well this is actually not federally endangered anymore because it's extinct and it can't be extinct and it endangered both. So <laughs> it's still alive only in gardens, thanks to gardeners sharing around. This is uh, a Hymenoxus, or now if you're dependent on your taxonomist, Tetra Nuris, uh, from up in uh, Indiana. Uh, just an amazing plant, already in, in bloom for us. So it's just a very early, only gets up about uh, the foliage three inches tall and the bloom about six inches, but a sort of a classic crevice garden. Where this grew in the wild, it grew on giant sheets of limestone. So obviously it, it loves the crevices. Another plant we've killed a lot of, same family. We're still in the aster family. Do you realize that Artemisia was an aster? This is Artemisia, uh, it's the gold version of Silver Mound. Uh, just an amazing little plant. Never could keep Artemisia alive. Uh, the Artemisia schmidiana in the crevice garden is done absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. So it's done a lot of what we wanted. It's taking those plants that did not like our summer rains and making most of them thrive. Mm -hmm. Same family. We haven't changed families yet. Isn't this amazing, the diversity? Mm -hmm. This is a South African Athona. A fantastic plant for this area. Mm -hmm. The leaves feel like something in the Azoaceae family, like the succulents. But the flowers are classic daisies. Uh, really neat little plant, about 10 to 12 
uh, inches tall. And I'm so thrilled. I, I, these, I never thought we could grow these. These are also in the aster family. These are Townsendias. Townsendias are basically, honey, I shrunk to aster. <laughs> uh, they're an inch tall and in full flower. They're from the western part of the United States, Utah, Washington, Oregon, places we never could grow anything. I killed anything that came from that area. And yet, here's Town Cindia. This I took this uh, this morning actually, coming into flower. So if this had been an, another day later, I could actually show it to you in flower. But to be able to grow those, so these little plants from areas that we know we can't grow stuff, go in the smallest cracks because they can take the least amount of water. So what we actually do is we will take them and we plant them, we don't pot them up, we put them in cell packs and when they're ready to plant we shake almost all the dirt off and take a little wire and actually just tuck it down into the cracks and then pour the permatillion or if the crack is too small we do have to use sand because you can't get permatillion in a crack much more than a quarter inch uh, below. Okay, switching families, Lithodora. Uh, Lithodora is uh, uh, an amazing plant. If you've seen it uh, at the box stores, it has cobalt blue flowers. I've killed more Lithodora <laughs> than Assad has. No, I'm, I mean, I've killed a lot of Lithodora. It, it's, it's, you can't grow it here. It, it always dies in the summer. It hates rain. I put this little Lithodora in, it just exploded. Went through the entire summer. Now, will it come back after winter? I don't know. I've never got one to live to winter, so we'll find out. But it absolutely loves the crevices. So, thrilled to grow that. This is in the borage family. Borage family uh, has things that we know, like uh, pulmonarias, are in the borage family. Uh, many of our, our common ornamentals. And the other member of the borage family that I just love for crevices, this is Onosma. It's a plant you see a lot through the Mediterranean region, uh, a lot in Greece and Turkey, just hanging off the rocks. It's just amazing. Normally yellow. This is Anosma alborosium. It's just, that's it taken today. So it's absolutely delightful and it's wonderful silver foliage. And we found these to, to go through the summer really well. And then the little dravas. Now, now we're into the brassicas. Uh, brassicas are the cabbage family. So these, we call these the cabbage patch kids. These are little, these are again little diminutive members of the cabbage family. Drava is tiny. That whole plant in full bloom is two inches tall. It's absolutely amazing. And this is uh, one that we grew a few years ago that was several years old. This is, uh, whoops, I thought I had another one in there. Oh, maybe later. Drabas, again, require really tiny crevices because these things do not like summer water. So you put them in a big crevice, they're going to die. Mm -hmm. So really tiny little crevices. This is Anethanema. This is uh, another in the cabbage family. doesn't look at all like a cabbage. Isn't that crazy? It has this beautiful evergreen foliage. And then in spring, this is uh, Ethanoma grandiflora flowering yesterday uh, in the garden, just starting to open. Beautiful plants. So many of these crufers, they're very short uh, in terms of, of, of explosion of color. It's like wham, bam, gone, and then comes back uh, next year. So that's why in a rock garden you want a large diversity. So you're always having things come in and out of flower. It's, it's all about diversity and it's about watching the change. Another uh, member of the uh, cabbage family, this is uh, one of the uh, Erebus, Erebus agricioides. And this has been in bloom now for a couple weeks, uh, about six inches tall, just absolutely delightful. Uh, this is the alyssum. Many of you may have grown alyssums, a beautiful yellow flower. Ours are just getting ready to come into flower. Also in the, the, uh, the same family, also in the cabbage family. Uh, this is one of the, uh, sorry, my brain just, brain just went blank. Uh, Fisaria, sorry, Fisaria kenya. It's a lot of native Fisarias, and these are little, they're called bladder pods. They have little yellow flowers. This is a small one, uh, Fisaria arizonica, in bloom today. That's just taken this morning in the garden. And this, again, one inch tall. These are teeny tiny little plants, but absolutely amazing. This is one I've never heard of. This is Hermathophylla pyrenaica. 
again from the Pyrenees, but I've never heard of the genus Hormathophyllum. But that's it in bloom. It's been in bloom now for a week in the crevices. Just a, again, cute little delightful thing that probably there's no way we could have grown that uh, outside of the crevices. It's a little Matheola. Uh, again, we're still in the same family. Uh, this one, uh, the, the tall ones are called stocks. If you've ever done a lot of flower arranging, this is a miniature stock, Matheola Montana. That's uh, in full flower, three <coughs> inches tall. <coughs> and then, of course, the wonderful cactus family. Oh my goodness, so many incredible, incredible flowers. So these are just a few of, of some of our favorites. This is Corophanthe, uh, uh, Sheer Rye. Took this yesterday. This is a kind of cactus chloranthus. That's in full bloom right yesterday, growing in the permatil, looking fabulous. It's a little epilantha, epilantha micromeris. And again, that's two, two and a half inches tall. Escobarius, Nidia, isn't that amazing? I love these things. And, and these will get lost in the, in the open garden, but there in the crevices, they just tuck in and, and just absolutely love this. Gymnocactus, that's been in bloom for a week now. That was taken yesterday. Just absolutely, I mean, to, the beauty of cactus. Everybody looks at the spines and they're like, ah, I'm sorry. That's the most incredible flower. It's so amazing. The notocactus from down in Uruguay, it's just been extraordinary. Notocactus africus, uh, that's a submambulosis. And I just, I mean, look at those flowers. These flowers are, these are, some of these are three inches across. It's crazy. And I mean, I'd grow that if it never flowered. It's a little opuntia. Opuntia denudata. Isn't that incredible? It just, it just fits the crevices so, so well. Uh, the uh, Pediocactus. Pediocactus simpsoni. This has been in bloom now for probably two weeks. This was the earliest cactus we had to bloom. And then the little Pediocactus miltonia in full bloom, one inch tall. <laughs> just so absolutely delightful. And then you can get big and gaudy. This is a, a Gymnocalisium growing in our garden. That was hybridized by one of our volunteers, Mike Pepe. Look at, I mean, is that, you tell me you wouldn't mind having something that in your garden? I mean, that's, that's pretty darn incredible. Or there's another of his hybrids in our garden. It loves the permatil. That's uh, Trichocerus iridescent watermelon. And it's hard to capture the color because it truly is iridescent. All of these, one family, great crevice plants. The Campanulaceae family. Campanulaceae are, are, are difficult. We, we've killed a lot of Campanulaceae. The ones we didn't kill, we had to run from because they took over. <laughs> so we're always delighted when we find the one that will grow here. And since we built the crevice, we've ordered seed of every companion we can find. This one has proven extraordinary. This is Garganica. It's a three to four inch plant, spreads to about a foot, and just flowers like crazy. That's it in the garden. Uh, really have fallen in love with this, a species that had really been, been off my radar. Also in the Campanula family, the Adrianthus. Uh, this is a plant we saw in the wild. We were in Bosnia. Uh, you would stop uh, along the road and just absolutely rocky, just just horrible, almost no soil. And there's an Adrianthus in full bloom. So now that we've got crevices, we actually are finally able to grow and flower Adrianthus. So again, a uh, member of the uh, Campanula family. All right, then we move into the uh, Carothalaceae family, and this is uh, uh, an Arenaria. These are this this some this some weedy Arenarias, but there's some incredible Arenarias. This has been in bloom now for about three days, and it's not even at peak yet. It's just a tiny little mat, about two inches tall, and so far at about six inches across. Arenaria grandiflora, meaning big flowers. You know, Carothalaceae is known for dianthus. So we're finally able to grow a lot of these miniature dianthus. There's some dianthus we can grow here, not too many, but these little miniatures have always been a problem because they hate summer rains. And so now we can finally grow those. So this is dianthus novalis, uh, just uh, probably mature height, about three inches. And then also in the Dianthus family are the Silenes. This is Silene maritima. 
And when this one just hangs over the rocks, Maritama means from the seacoast. And the leaves are rubbery, which you see on a lot of seacoast plants, to be able to handle that reflected heat and the salt spray. And that's it in bloom. Uh, that was yesterday. So it's just starting to open now. Of course, the Crassulaceae has some amazing plants. Some of the little dwarf sedums. This is a, a, a sedum uh, elecombianum cutting edge. Just took that picture yesterday. Perfect uh, crevice garden plant. And of course, the, the hens and chickens. Oh my goodness, they're, they love us here. They don't like our humidity and they don't like our rainfall. Other than that, they love us. <laughs> so they're great in the winter and spring and fall. But what we found in the permatil, they're absolutely fabulous. So this, the diversity in this group is incredible. I mean, you just, just look at the colors, the hairs. The, oh. Is that pretty amazing? This is one, we, we tried it once last year, we killed it, we put in another half dozen this year. I, this plant, if this will grow here, oh my goodness, gold nugget, it's just like the most, I mean, I took that picture. That, that's just insane, the color. So the, this, the amazing uh, group members of that is so easy to grow. In the gentian family, the native Eustoma. This is actually a Texas native. It's a roadside plant that gets mowed off by the highway department so they can plant wildflowers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty incredible. Uh, it matures out about 15 inches tall, but very thin, so it actually does fit well in the crevice. We've planted quite a few of these, so you can see those uh, late spring. Even geraniums for the crevices. This is a, a South African pelargonium. It loves it right there by the uh, concrete in the crevices. Uh, it, it's just a crazy little thing, pelargonium lurid. And some of the little hypericums. We've, we've, we're going back now and looking at things, many of the things we've killed. Uh, Hypericum cerastioides loves it in the crevice garden. And we've ordered probably, probably planted a seed now of about 12 more of the little dwarf St. John's worts. One of the things I'm really excited about are the aral iris. Uh, aral iris are a group of iris. There's five sections from uh, Turkey, from, uh, from all the stands. It, it's every country that ends in stand has aral iris. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran. They hate summer moisture. They like hard, cold winters. So we, we finally ordered some from out in this California, Southern Cal, and the owner, he's a hybridizer, he called me and said, I can't sell these to you because you'll kill them. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but we have a crevice garden. <laughs> I said, I've killed them before. So we put these in, these were put in last July. It's tiny, single divisions. That's in bloom today. Uh, so we have just opened up this entire Pandora's box of aral iris, and they just, the colors, the patterns are totally different. This is uh, just one, this is another, this in bloom today. That's the way the wild species look. They're just, the patterns are unlike anything else. So we're really excited. We're just gonna go completely hog wild now with, uh, with aral iris. The little miniature gladiolus. This is, well, this is one of our cheek series that we introduced. These are from gladiolus tristis. It's a little spring rock garden gladiolus. Never gets very tall. Perfect for the crevice garden. This is also in the iris family. So the same family as the last two we showed. Then we move into the salvia family, the lamiaceae. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the wonderful germanders, uh, the teucrians. Uh, we've killed teucrium after teucrium <laughs> before we got to crevices. They just will not take our summer heat, humidity, and rain. But in the crevice garden, that's the middle of last summer. Absolutely thrive. Jucrium cosonia, look at that. Just elegant. This one matures out about 18 inches, one inch tall. Just this amazing, amazing mat. No thalerian. That's a plant that pretty much no one can grow. It's native to uh, Turkey, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And a little bit into India. What an amazing plant to bloom now. This is in the lily family. It's a plant almost nobody knows because they don't have crevice gardens. 
some of the little dwarf snapdragons. Uh, just amazing, amazing plants. Uh, this is a little dwarf one, uh, Antirinum glutinosa. This is from, uh, from Spain. Now this is interesting. This is now in the plantain family. So if you know plantain, the weed, this is now in the family as the plantain weed. I do not understand that. I, I liked it better when it was in the scrofularia family. <laughs> and uh, this is also in the same family, globularia. This is one we saw over in uh, Croatia. Little bitty purple flowers. I'm about two days away from having this in full bloom. Just same family. And then pinstamens are now in the same family with the wild plant. I mean, that just makes no sense. The pinstamens, there's an incredible array of them from the Great Basin region all the way up to the West Coast. Killed every one of them. Now in crevice gardens, they're thriving. All these plants that we've killed, we now get this second chance. Actually, for us, it's probably about the fourth or fifth chance. <laughs> but we're actually finally able to grow these. So it's just so rewarding to open this pallet back up that we had closed off for so long. <coughs> Here's a weird one. This is Bacchensia cabulica. Isn't that odd? That's just a crazy name. This is in the plumbago family of all things. And this is a biennial, so it's only two years, but it does reseed. So uh, it's, it's, that's a pretty cool little plant, only about an inch tall and about six inches across. Ghania limons, uh, these are used for flower rangers. Never been able to grow that before. And that's it, uh, that's it yesterday in the garden, just getting ready to spike, so same family. Then we move to the Polymenaceae family, which has all our wonderful flocks. This is a really tough one to grow for us. It's been almost impossible until we plant it in Permatil. This is our native Phlox Buckleyi. It's a West Virginia native. It's not what you buy as Phlox Buckleyi because nobody sells the real thing. Everything probably sells some hybrid that has nothing to do with it. But that is, that is the honest wild collected plant from wild Virginia thriving. So that's going to be a great crevice garden plant. Does it have I have not smelled it. That's a great question. I will go smell it tomorrow and let you know. <laughs> I honestly do not know. This one does. This is uh, part of a new series, the Confetti Series, bred by our friend Hans Hansen. These are only about four inches tall. They've been in full bloom for two to three weeks, and they're tiny. They're perfect for crevice or, or rock guard. This is confetti purple. These are just coming out this year. We. I got them a year early for trials, but they are incredible. And then this little, this is Vivian's White Blanket. Uh, it's a cross between our native flux subulata and the West Coast flock. And this little thing is one inch tall. That's it in flower yesterday. Just absolutely amazing. Oh my gosh, it's so incredible. Mm -hmm. This is Bora Novice. This is a, a little, again, hybrid of subulata and one of the Western species from uh, a breeder over in the Czech Republic, and it, again, about an inch, inch and a half tall, and that's it in flower this afternoon. Just extraordinary little little flocks. And in the uh, Polygonaceae family, this is our native Eriogonum. Now, Eriogonums are buckwheats. Uh, not the buckwheat we eat, but the ornamental buckwheat. Uh, normally, they're all out west, except for this one that grows up in the shale barrens of Virginia and West Virginia. And we've tried it before. I could keep them for about six months until we got screed. And they love, absolutely love the, the crevices. And then we move into the, the fern family, the Polypodiaceae. There's, some, there's a lot of ferns that grow in deserts. They love deserts. They love dry land. They love crevices. This is one of my friends at Yucca de collected down in southern Brazil. This is uh, hmm. Uh, sorry, my just went blank. Pleopeltis, excuse me, Bombasina. This has been fantastic planted in pure permatil. This is just, it's a foot tall, evergreen through the winter. Just absolute delight. And then our, our native Calanthes linosa. This is a little dwarf form we call Mighty Tidy. Only about four inches tall. Thrill. That's where it grows in natural rock cracks. Or this, this is from our West Texas expedition, a little fern called Bomeria, one inch tall, and it just spreads on these tiny little rhizomes right through the rock cracks. Just an absolute delight, just made for crevice gardens. 
How about our native Selaginellus? Almost nobody grows these. Selaginella rupestris, we collected this up in the Shell Barrens of Virginia. Less than an inch tall. Evergreen. It loves the crevice. It just weaves around right through. It just fills them in so lovely. And you can plant other things that come up through it. Just, just a delight. And then the wonderful uh, anemones. Uh, I'd pretty much given up on anemones. I have tried anemones everywhere in my garden. And, and not all the anemones, but this is one we saw in the wild in Crete. This is anemone coronary, where it grows in just the worst rocky hillsides, areas that get two inches of rain a year. And I killed it every time I plant this. And uh, my wife Anita, uh, who's actually here tonight, thank you for coming, uh, showed me this picture in a magazine a couple years ago. She says, can you grow this for me? Because I just think this is mm. really cool. I'd like to photograph it. Mm. And I planted and planted and planted it. <laughs> and finally, in the crevice, I was able to say, we've got it now. We've actually got it growing. So, so that was really neat. This is one called Bicolor. And that's been in bloom for probably three weeks now. Just a delight. Mm. And there's another. Uh, isn't that just, ah, uh, the anemones are just, Anemone pavonia, they're just made for photographers. They're just so absolutely intricate. Uh, and they're, of course, in the uh, ranunculus uh, group. And ending up, getting down toward the end, uh, the, the Daphnes in the family Tamalaceae. I grew up, all I've heard, Daphnes are hard to grow. Daphnes are hard to grow. Daphnes are hard to grow. So, so I've always cuddled Daphnes before I killed them. <laughs> <laughs> So a few years ago, I'm, I'm in Crete, and this is just the most barren place in, in terms of <coughs> vegetation if it's not irrigated, because again, they get just a couple inches of rain up to, to maybe a foot in some places, and they get it all in December. The rest of the year, there's nothing, and everything is raw. We go out in the wild, and here are Daphne's growing in full sun, no rain, and it just, I, I had to totally rethink everything about Daphne. So when we built the crevices, I reordered all the Daphne's I've killed, mm -hmm. and there they are. <laughs> They're thriving. That picture's from yesterday, in full bloom in the garden. Daphne's are, it, it's just a whole different mindset change. But the screen has, and the crevices have just opened up the world of Daphne's. And of course, the amazing violas, a plant that you see in the wild here in North Carolina, here all we found these all the way out to, to Arkansas. They grow in the worst horrible soil imaginable. Perfect place for them is there in the screes. Our screed garden now, I hope you'll come out and see it. We've got spring open house coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, the, the parts that you've seen, we've got 200 feet built out of a 300 foot area. There are currently 961 different kinds of plants in the screed garden. We've already killed 150. <laughs> so we're killing plants really fast in there because we've got a lot to learn. But we've got another, probably another thousand ready to go in the ground. So they'll be going in the ground in the next uh, month. So uh, again, so much to learn. Yes, what questions about, now? Um, Get the lavender. Line. What about lavender? We do have a couple lavenders in there. So, so far, so good. So I'm pretty excited. Now we're going to go to the dwarf lavenders because obviously lavenders can get really big. But uh, there's some small ones that only get a few inches tall. Came through last summer, came through the winter. So fingers crossed. Uh, Jeremy brought in some of our crevice garden soil. So afterwards, if you want to come up and see what it is actually made of, uh, we'll be glad to show you. I'm sure he can entertain questions about the the actual the crevice mix because he's the one that came up with putting a little bit of a soil in it to give it some uh, cation exchange capacity. The permatil we use actually has really good nutrient holding ability. You, you wouldn't think so. And it still seems weird that roots will grow that deep in three months in gravel. That just does not seem, it's against everything we know as gardeners that you have to water and water and water when soil you do. But in gravel, it, it's, it's interesting how it holds moisture. It holds moisture without being wet. Gravel's really fast, as is concrete. Any other questions? Yes? How will you keep it clean, or will you keep it clean? Okay. Like plant debris, it's just 
That's a very good question. I, I don't have the answer yet. Uh, you know, leaves will obviously blow out. Uh, a little debris is part of nature's cycle to break down. So it's small enough stuff, it breaks down in there, and that's what keeps the plants alive because, yeah, they do like some organic matter. Some of them have already reached down to the bottom of the crevice, 18 inches, to find the organic matter down there. And it's really interesting how the root tips are fine if they're in some compost, but not the actual roots itself, because they have to be able to uh, respire much faster. Great question. We're still learning. I mean, this is, again, the oldest section's been in now one year. We've got so much to learn. It's just, it's a really exciting opportunity. We, we think the potential for cities, instead of uh, burying the buildings that they're tearing down, put crevice gardens in. Because one after establishment, there is, there's no watering maintenance, there's no fertilizer ever put on these. Uh, I think it's a pretty neat way of taking things out of the landfill, because we have to look at it recycling now. The permatill was, was actually, when I started working with permatill people 35 years ago, they were burying this in the landfill. It was a waste product for making concrete blocks. That's why they hired a landscape architect from NC State, Chuck Freed. They said, find us a use for this. We can't afford to put it in the landfill. Hmm. So our crevices are sort of the ultimate in recycle because we got the concrete recycled, we got the permatill that's recycled, and the seed were donated to the seed exchange. So they've all been recycled. <laughs> yes? That whole bank is facing east? It is facing east, correct. Now the first section I showed you, there is two sides of that. One side faces east and one side faces west. And we sort of like the east because that morning sun is obviously cooler. And so some of these things that we're trying to fool into thinking they're growing in Central Asia, the cool sun is much better than the hot sun. Now we've recently added some more little small crevice areas in the parking lot. Uh, and those have different exposures. Now in those though, we did not go with straight permatil, we went with a three to one uh, mix. Yes. Did you put in your uh, carnivorous plant in the seed right there? Did you talk about Not yet. Uh, what, what Vlad's talking about is we're in our next section, we're going to build a seed with uh, serpentine uh, soils. So serpentine is a, is a weird kind of soil. It's, it's where almost nothing will grow. So the things that grow there are really weird because no normal plants, no weeds will grow in there. Typically around here, we want a soil that is, has a calcium-magnesium ratio of 5 to 1. That's, that's, that's a good soil for pretty much everything we grow. Serpentine soils are 1 to 5. So they're completely flipped around. They have 5 times as much magnesium as they do calcium. So we've actually, I said there's a spot in western North Carolina, there's one little serpentine area, so we're going to send a couple of garbage pans up there and fill it full of soil, and that's where we're going to plant. There's a, there's a carnivorous plant that grows on the west coast called Darlingtonia. It's just wild. It's just, it's like a, it's like a pitcher plant with a mustache, with a handlebar mustache. It's really freaking. I've killed many of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in a serpentine seed which is where they grow in the wild. So that's, supposedly these can't be grown outside of that area, so we're going to find out. So we think it's all soil and, and habitat. Yes? Doesn't BW Wells have some serpentine areas? Don't know. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find uh, in the serpentine book. There's actually an entire book, a cystic book on serpentine soils. I think they do. I was there last summer, and we, I remember them talking about some plants that grew really? there that wouldn't grow anywhere else, and they were talking we, about the calcium magnesium thing. The one north of town? Yeah. yeah oh, I'll check. That'd be safe from having to drive out to the mountains if they'll let us borrow some soil. That would be really cool. Thanks, that's a great area. For those that don't know, B.W. Wells was a very, very, just a, a pioneer botanist in the area, and he did a lot of work down the coastal plain with the big savannah, but he has a beautiful area of flat rocks up north of town. If you haven't been up there, there are plants that grow there that don't grow around here. So it really is a neat habitat. But uh, yeah, thanks for that tip. I'll, I'll definitely be in touch with those folks. It's a great area. Other 
comments, questions? Tony, I, your, your nursery, people will come for their open, your open house and so on, and they'll want to buy these little plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They almost have to give them a, a, a crash course yeah. because they'll think, oh, I'm going to plant this in my clay soil and it's going to thrive, and they're dead wrong. Absolutely. And we don't have these things for sale yet. We're still in the trialing mode. Sure. So once we trial and find out what's going to really grow well here, and uh, we've shared a lot of stuff with the, the Arboretum here. They're going to put a lot of stuff up on theirs, and they've shared stuff with us. So we're all learning together. Once we do, then I think there is a market for this material. Right now, I tell everybody, join the Rock Garden Society. Their seed exchange is like 3,000 items. I mean, you won't live long enough to try all the stuff that's in there. It's just insane. So. The, the potential is there. We've, and we've got a great rock garden group in there, in here, this area. A lot of people are, are in here tonight <coughs> from that. And it just, it opens up so many doors for spaces that we, whether it's a small garden, whether it's a, uh, you know, a, you can almost make these, you can make them in a trough. You can make these anywhere. I know uh, Jeremy's doing some side jobs now, putting in several crevice gardens in the area. He's sort of become our local crevice garden guru. So. Uh, it, it's something that's really catching on. There is a Facebook group, Modern Crevice Gardens. There's s almost 700 members worldwide on this thing. And, that's, and, and it hasn't been around that long. I mean, this thing is just, what's it been around? A few months, it seems. People are joining like crazy. This crevice garden thing is an epidemic. It really is, I mean, I'm not making this up. It's, it's, it's spreading like wildfire. These things are going in everywhere. It's just gardens all over Europe. I mean, Google the Utrecht Botanic Gardens. Oh my gosh, they're, they've gone crevice crazy. It's just, it's really wonderful. So I think people are finally seeing it. And there's a couple of others, it turns out, that have tried it with concrete. So, you know, whether it's rock or concrete, uh, just get out there and experiment. But we think this recycling idea is just, it's just got so much potential. Christine? Yeah. Can I just move to cement saw? Cement saw. Cement saw, yes. Okay. There is a, a saw made that you, it's like a, uh, it's like a skill saw. It, have you seen those things where they, the jaws are like where they cut people out of cars? Okay, it's put a concrete blade on it. And you just take that saw and just go, yeah, yeah. and it sprays water at the same time to keep the dust down so you're not breathing it. But you can cut through a lot of concrete in a short time. I mean, would you cut like 30, 40 tons a day? It goes fast. You yeah. cut, all you got to do, you got a six inch piece of concrete, you just cut it about one to two inches deep, and then a chisel and it'll break where you tell it. You don't have to cut all the way through like a log, you just got to store it. Yeah, great, great tip. Jeremy McDowell, all about concrete sawing. He's become a concrete saw expert. But it beats the hell out of the chisel. Because believe me, that was, that was really painful to watch. You still have to, you still have to do some chiseling, but, but it really cuts it down so much. So. Yeah, when they got the, the our first batch concrete had wire mesh. Yeah, I just made sure that the wire mesh was face up, uh -huh. and the concrete saw goes right through. You go, you go through that. Yeah, now you got if you get too much metal, it can cover the diamonds in the blade, but just a little bit of mesh is okay. Yeah, and we, one of the things that, that Jeremy found is you, you don't want to use concrete with fibers in it because that doesn't that doesn't make a good crevice. So when you, you want old concrete that before they got fancy and figured out you didn't need metal wire to hold it together. Mm. Have you tried staining it with iron oxide or manganese just to get some different colors and patterns? We haven't tried that yet. We did a little test with muriatic acid to see if that would uh, change the color a little bit. Uh, didn't see any enough results to go through that process. but. Anything is possible, and that's the beauty of people having their own artistic flair, is they can try different things. We believe, especially in the sea, we can already see where it's starting to change colors. Water does amazing things, so if you can have just even a drip, it will not take long. That whole thing will just moss over and you get these beautiful brown streaks through the concrete. 
So it's pretty exciting that way. So I'm sure we're going to play with a lot of different things to color. Yeah. Uh months of data and we just we didn't see that one coming that that really surprised us a lot and it explained why a lot of the we're, we're, we're testing both the west and the east sides absolutely no we're seeing the very same temperature within a degree or two Now we're we're definitely headed in that direction. This this is this is part of the. This was so great about the learning process because we could not figure out why we kill so many agaves because we know they're hardy in the ground. They just don't like the moisture. So we put them in there thinking, all right, we got that solved. But we did not figure on the depth that the cold would go. So we got to go back and you know that's great on things from the cold areas. Anything from the stands. And Turkey and those are that's going to be fabulous in there. So we we know now what to focus on We just have to come up with new areas. So can, the question is can we counteract that by having overhangs? So that we don't get any moisture will that will that mitigate some so in this next section We have a lot more questions that we're going to answer in our construction process of how we do that We planned a lot of cyclamens in there which so far are doing really well, but we did those all with overhangs because they need just a little bit of protection from the moisture. And so far they are thriving because where we saw those growing in the wild, well over there they grow everywhere, but they really do well in the crevices. So really neat when you see them and you say, wow, this is really growing in a, a really dry, really protected area. And then that works even better in our moist conditions. Great questions. Any any others? Maybe you could like dig in some uh, like uh, the corrugated pipe under rocks and maybe pipe the warm air from. You know, <laughs> that sounds like an engineering solution. Yeah. Well, we'll just we'll just put in the geothermal uh, volume uh, next. <laughs> Yeah, that would that would definitely that would solve our problem. What a great idea for the next section. Why didn't I think of that? That's what that's what's so beautiful about this community is we everybody brings ideas and we all share and that's why that's why these are so much fun because we can tell you what we've done, what we've learned, what what worked, what didn't work, and then you go home and try stuff and then hopefully you'll share it back with with us and with the other gardening community. Well, again, thank you all very much. Come see us. Thank you, Tony.